All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Danielle and Morton for having us come and present again this year. Um, this is always one of the most enjoyable conferences of the year. The energy, the demographics we get from around the world. Um, one thing I've always loved about aging, uh, being in the aging biology field, is it really attracts people from everywhere. And I think to create a movement, you need everybody. So it just always brings me great joy to be in this audience. Um, two, uh, Morton won't remember this, but um, since uh, dinner was coming up, we had a hypothetical conversation yesterday. He said, just, we're all going to fast together. So we're just going to blow straight through dinner. He said, can you go an hour and a half? And I said, probably not, but I'll, I'll do my best. But um, it might take a little while. So just so you know. Um, also, just as a treat, um, don't worry about taking pictures. I've got a QR code at the end if you want the slides. So let's just make it easy for everybody. Okay? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the immune system, aging, and senescence. Okay. So key themes from the talk. Um, the immune system, turns out, is really, really important. Um, it's one of the best pillars we can use uh, to modulate health span. Uh, unfortunately, our immune function peaks in our 20s, and it, it kind of steadily declines thereafter. And so the opportunity becomes, if you can get responsible restoration of the immune system, this can be one of the best tools and most logical tools we can use uh, to mobilize for extending health span. Um, the reason I was excited about starting an immune company a couple years ago is I just think it's better and easier sometimes to work with nature than try to work against nature. And the immune system and therapies focused on the immune system allow you to do that. Okay. Uh, four parts to the talk. Um, first, I'm going to talk about senescence sort of as a field and what I feel is a, would be a revolution for the field. Um, it's obviously been a, an area of interest for over a decade now. Um, I'm going to talk about how when we accumulate senescent cells, it's actually um, a result of a failing immune system. Uh, three, I'm going to talk about how we identified and then eventually how we restored the natural immune mechanism behind removing senescent cells. And lastly, I'm going to talk to you about why this actually matters. So translationally, of course, is the reason we're here, um, but does the data support and does it give us faith that in a clinical study we can see improvements um, in indications based on clinical, uh, clinical relevant markers, not just talking about senescence or mechanisms or immune system, but does it actually improve disease in a way that's uh, sustainable and advantageous? Okay, so first, uh, you know, TPP around senescence. Um, first, intermittent dosing is one of the best value propositions of senescence. You know, most drugs you take now, you take multiple doses a day. Um, they kind of wear away at disease. They also have off-target effects. Um, but intermittent dosing is one of the best value props if you have a good senescence program. Um, it's good for cost of goods. And one of the things I'm most proud of is actually it's good for global access and global, um, global populations. So it's not just about a therapy that can go to a subset of people. It's a therapy that can be applied, if done correctly, um, to the majority of the world. And that's really important for us. Um, two, you need specificity. So as you, if you follow the senescence field, you probably know that most of the early senolytics are actually reprogrammed cancer drugs. And so those drugs may have worked well to uh, stop certain cancers or halt or slow down certain cancers, but were they really meant to be uh, removed, uh, used for senescence removal? And typically the answer is no, and that's why translation from first generation senolytics um, has been a bit challenging. Um, three, and I think we always get caught in the aging field of thinking of our, our mechanism as being trying to get the best in class senescence removal or telomere or mitochondria approach, um, but I think you need to think about is this actually the best drug, not just for senescence, but is it best in class for the therapeutic indication you want to explore? Safety is critical, obviously, as we age. You know, I have to get the question of, you know, what would this drug look like in a healthy population? And having um, an incredibly good safety profile really feeds that. So can we take these things preventatively? And then lastly, I think this is one of the, another value prop here is, you know, if you can get systemic removal of senescence cells, it would be a big deal. Um, about half of people over the age of 60 um, have two comorbidities that jumps up every 10 years to about 70% and 80% uh, by the time you reach your 80s. So the idea you're going to have multiple diseases as you age is very likely, so it wouldn't be great to have a drug that could actually treat multiple indications in parallel. So no big deal, but if you can do all that, I think you have potentially a revolution um, in the field. Okay, so let's talk about the immune system. So first, a little bit on senescence. Uh, these are cells that have been irreversibly damaged. Uh, something has happened to these cells. It can be injuries. It can be diets. 
Um, it can be ROS, um, high glucose. But the net result is that these are cells that have been uh, put into permanent cell cycle arrest. And that's okay, that, that's normal. Um, and over time, what these cells do is they start to become, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, they become inflammatory. And the idea of the inflammation from the senescent cells really to try to um, help the body identify that there's a problem in that, in that tissue or in that organ and recruit help or recruit the immune system um, towards that area where, where help is needed. Um, and so that, again, that is okay. That, you know, cells becoming senescent is okay. So, uh, the stress cells becoming uh, inflammatory can be okay as well. And the issues with age and with disease as these things um, uh, start to slow down, uh, the immune system begins to fail, which means the senescent cells are they're there originally to show um, a problem area, do not get removed effectively or quickly. And so it's really an immune system failure that leads to the accumulation of these senescent cells. So what happens is with the paracrine function of a, of a senescent cell, it can actually make other cells in the microenvironment become senescent as well. So it's saying, you know, you're not going to, you know, if the immune system doesn't remove me, um, I'm going to amplify the signal and create more inflammation and spread through cell-to-cell -cell contact. And that's really where senescence becomes a problem and leads to disease. So over time, it gives you inflammation, it drives fibrosis, it even uh, drives your stem cells to become senescent as well. So that's the challenge with senescence, not just the um, the event of a, senescent, a cell becoming senescent, it's the accumulation of the cells that actually drives disease. Okay, uh, these are indications where senescent cells have been removed in preclinical models, uh, where it's been shown to impact and improve endpoints. There's also indications if you look at human tissue where it's shown that senescent cells will track um, chronologically with disease. And so these are indications where it's thought that senescent cells are actually causal to human conditions. So this gives you a roadmap of where you can apply good senescence technology. Okay, so what do we do about this? So, first of all, the, the idea that the immune system has been interesting for removing senescence cells has been around for a while. It's always been a, a talking point. Um, when I used to go to senescence conferences seven plus years ago, we would always say, it'd be great um, if, the, if you know, we know the immune system does this, wouldn't it be great if we could figure out how to modulate that therapeutically? And so when we started, this, started thinking of starting this company, that became the focus. Can we figure out nature's natural mechanism to removing these senescent cells? And so this has been written about for many times, often with a question mark at the end, or often pointing to um, some immune cells that the people have tried but not been able to translate. Um, it's just a sampling of papers. Uh, but over time, what we did is we actually looked at senescent cells from non-adjacent indications. We wanted to look at indications that were not like each other to identify the common thread we can pull on with the immune system. And so we looked at pulmonary tissue, looked at T1D tissue, and we looked at um, adipose tissue from diabetic patients. And we figured out, um, by using single cell analysis, we figured out, this is a, about nine months worth of work condensed into about 20 seconds, so I'm gonna put the paper up here if you wanna read it. Um, we figured out that natural killer T cells can actually regulate very effectively the removal of pathological senescent cells. And that's the data I'm gonna show you shortly. So just a little time lapse of, of how we think about this. You know, you're young, you're healthy, you're disease free. Um, your immune system works quite well. You see very little senescence accumulation in your first 10 to 20, 25 years of life. But as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, by, you, by the time you hit your mid 20s, your immune system starts to slow down a little bit and that opens the door for the accumulation of senescent cells. And so the good news is with a therapeutic intervention, we can restore the natural killer T cell function in the tissue that leads to the removal of senescent cells, which then accumulates um, in an improvement in disease-relevant endpoints that I'll show you now. Okay, so the data, so the, the, the most important stuff. Okay, so the first model uh, that we've tested is in pulmonary fibrosis. Um, for patients, it's a very severe disease. Uh, life expectancy is just a couple of years. Um, there are no good therapies out there right now that really have a, much of an impact um, on fibrosis or even improving uh, patient um, outcomes in any significant way besides survival by a couple years. And so there's a huge need in this field to find a better therapy. It's also an indication where senescent cells, if you look at the, uh, the lung tissue of human IPF patients, have a massive amount of senescent cells developing the lung tissue. So in this model, you take uh, mice, you induce a, a, a lung injury via, blind, uh, via, via myosin, um, in, uh, via the trachea. This uh, induces senescence, inflammation, and fibrosis 
in the lung. Um, this is an acute model, so it happens relatively quickly. Um, we give relatively high dose of bleomycin, so the injuries we're giving the mice um, are just on the edge of, uh, of, um, of causing mortality, but typically the, the animals um, will survive uh, the study even um, when left untreated. And so what happens is uh, very quickly the disease accumulates, and by day 10 we give a single dose of our drug. So it's just the whole regimen here is one single dose. Um, at day 10, you've started to, the disease has actually started to plateau in the mice. You're already seeing senescence inflammation in fibrosis. So at day 10, we give one dose. It's a small molecule drug. Um, it's given uh, subcutaneously. And the first thing we want to look at is did we actually activate the NKT cells in the lung? So that's down here. So on the bottom left are your control animals. They've not been treated. Uh, the green bar are the animals uh, that have been injured with bleomycin and given fibrosis but no drug treatment. Then the animals in the orange are animals we've actually uh, injured and also treated. So your treated group sees an increase in the NKT cells of the lung, and that results in a senescence removal um, that is significant. So you see, again, the black, healthy animals, untreated, uninjured, very low levels of senescence. You see the spike with the uh, injured group without treatment. Then you see when we treat them, it comes down uh, quite quickly within four days. Okay, so now does it actually matter for an endpoint that we'd want to see uh, going forward. So again, uh, the regimen is up top, a uh, single dose at day 10, and at day 21, we look at inflammation and fibrosis. So key endpoints you'd want to see in the clinical studies. So TNF-alpha uh, comes down back to homeostatic levels, um, and, and IL-17A also attenuates. Um, these are relevant cytokines because they are cytokines that drive fibrosis. So when they are elevated, you see more fibrosis. When they come down, you see less fibrosis. So the culmination here is you see about a 75 to 80% reduction in the fibrosis uh, from the single dose. And so what's happened here is we've activated the immune system. It has uh, removed a vast majority of the senescent cells in the lung tissue. And that, distal to that, we see an improvement in the actual fibrotic, um, total fibrotic area of the lungs. Okay. Um, this is another way to measure fibrosis called PSR, so picoserious red. Um, so just, you know, I showed you hydroxyproline, which is whole lung hydroxyproline in the previous slide. Uh, this is PSR. Um, so again, just another, another measure of collagen deposition. And then, interesting, you know, here's what it looks like physically. So um, this is a untreated, uninjured animal. This is the lung, a lung slice using PSR. So uh, you compare that now to a injured animal with no treatment. So you can see the a vast difference. But then when you treat the animals, you look more like this. So you see a nice improvement in the fibrosis. And I just want to reiterate that the, uh, the current standard of care does not really resolve fibrosis in any meaningful way. So even if you could stop fibrosis or even slow its progression, that's a big deal. Um, this suggests that we might be able to do even a little bit better than that. Okay. Um, we also did a study against the standard of care, so we went against Nintendib. Um, Nintendib does about over $3 billion of sales um, just in, the, in, the, in Europe alone. Um, it's a drug that's been around for uh, over a decade now. Um, it is a drug, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, like I said in the beginning, it, it can improve survival in patients uh, for a couple years, but in terms of improving fibrosis or actually uh, clinical uh, outcomes, um, it's really not that effective there. Um, so what we did is we put 10 doses of uh, Nintendib into these animals um, against one dose of our drug. Um, we did an allometric scale of human uh, to mouse to come up with a 60 mg per kg dose for Nintendib. And um, even when you give 10 doses of Nintendib, as, you, as we can see um, in the uh, pinkish, orangish, pinkish bar, um, really no effect on fibrosis. Uh, when you give one dose of our drug, we see a dramatic effect um, on the improvement in, in fibrosis. So we believe that this can replace and become a new standard of care uh, for pulmonary fibrosis based on the efficacy alone. Okay. Um, so second model is in, in uh, type 2 diabetes, so this is a high-fat diet. Um, very different model in these animals. Uh, we, we put them on high-fat diets uh, for about four months. We don't intervene during that time. The mice become obese. They get senescence accumulation in the adipose tissue. Um, they have high glucose uh, uh, intolerance. They're highly insulin resistant. And the question becomes, you know, after that happens, can we treat these animals and see a reversal in that phenotype? So day zero, you initiate high-fat diets. That happens for four months. At day 120, we give one dose of the drug. Again, we look at NKT activation. So you see in the high-fat diet animals we've treated, we see a nice um, increase in the NKT levels in the adipose tissue this time. So not the lung, but now the adipose. Again, we see a nice reduction in the senescent cells. And then, of course, when asked the most important question is, how does this actually matter for disease? 
So again, the model up top, uh, insulin resistance improves uh, from the single dose. This happens 10 days after um, the, the treatment is given. So first you must dose, then you must remove senescent cells, then you see a, a culmination in improvement of disease. So insulin resistance improves. Uh, glucose tolerance also improves. So when you challenge the mice with the bolus of glucose, you'll see nice, uh, um, you see the mice that even though they don't lose a significant amount of weight in the study, uh, they, they're now metabolically much more regular. They can actually metabolize glucose uh, much more effectively um, from removing the senescent adipocytes. Okay. And what's really interesting is you, uh, when you looked at A1C, so HbA1C, if you suspect you have diabetes or suspect anyone has diabetes, one of the first things you would get done is actually get your A1C levels tested. And so in the mice, we can do the same study. And in this study, we showed, uh, so again, the model is the same as before. We took two measurements, one at uh, month one after the dose, and the second one at month two after the dose. Um, I should mention that from the top all the way over, for, from day zero all the way to day 176, the animals were on the high-fat diet. They never came off the diet. Um, so at day 120, we treat the animals. You see that the, uh, the black line, the control animals, normal animals, uh, the A1C levels stay very stable. Um, the purple animals are the ones we've treated, so their high-fat diet, when they start and they remain on the diet, their A1C levels come down over a period of two months from a single dose. Um, and as you'd expect, in the green line are animals that we have not treated, their A1C levels as they remain on the diet um, increase over those two months. So uh, we see about a two-month effect um, from the single dose just by removing the senescent um, inflammatory insults um, that can drive uh, diabetes. Okay. So what's the value prop here? Um, everything I showed you today is single dose efficacy with a small molecule. So again, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, cost of goods, um, intermittent treatments, um, it's just a different way to think about medicine. So in my opinion, it's, it's one of the best paradigm shifts we could have to not be rely upon taking a medicine every single day. Um, two is systemic. So as I mentioned, you know, we, the idea is to have a, a, a drug that can have a multi-target impact, um, a multi-target indication. So, um, this systemic approach, um, we've shown it in the lung that it works. We've also shown the ad, um, adipose. We're now going to explore some other uh, organs as well to see um, we can prove uh, additional metabolic disorders. Um, it's a natural mechanism. So, you know, I think it's, like I said, it's always easier to work with nature than against nature. Um, good precedent for safety. Um, we've gone to 30 times the effective dose in our first uh, safety study and did not see any adverse events. Um, it's robust, so it didn't matter if we treated the animals that would have been injured acutely or given long-term chronic diets. Um, specifically targetable, so we talk about safety and translation. Um, the way we target NKT cells is very specific, so we don't see off-target effects. Um, and the cost of goods is really attractive. Um, in, in lung fibrosis, those are reimbursed at about $110,000 per patient per year with the current drugs. Um, we could come in at, at quite a bit less than that. Okay. So in summary, failed immune clearance leads to the accumulation of senescent cells. Um, the immune system, uh, specifically NKT cells, can be harnessed to remove senescent cells. And following a single dose, we see expansion of NKT cells, improvement in disease, and no adverse events, even at 30 times the effective dose. Okay. Um, future opportunities, if you're interested, um, we're always hiring. Um, so I've got a couple of positions that we're considering right now. Um, we have a, a wonderful group of investors, including a number of venture groups, as well as the former Novartis CEO and the current uh, CSO of Alphabet. If that speaks to you, uh, come and find me. Happy to chat. Also have some really nice non dilutive support from AbV and Esai. Um, to our lab in San Francisco. And as I promised, um, QR codes if you want slides or my contact information. I won't count who reaches out which way more than the other. All right. Thank you so much, Robin. That was fantastic.